Hello, everybody. Hello. Sorry to keep you out of the sun and the jacuzzis, <laughs> uh, and the bars and the gambling, um, but you can do that tonight. So uh, thanks for having me here, Mike. It's great to share the uh, floor, really, with Robert, Mika, and David. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to move pretty quickly because uh, we've, we've run over run over a little bit of time, which is uh, which is kind of standard procedure with these kind of things. But I want to go through quite a few different subjects here. I'm trying not to repeat anything that the other speakers have said, but some there are some crossovers because the way I look at things, I look at things from a sort of global perspective. I just can't help it. I, I become like an obsessed megalithomaniac traveller, uh, and I get all around the world at any opportunity on cruises, boats, balloons, anything you like. Um, here's just some uh, uh, photos uh, of these sort of serpents, which I keep finding all over the world. Now, only part of this talk is going to cover this idea that there was like some kind of serpent elite. What I'm interested in is what that means. I believe it has some connection with earth energies, with ley lines, with grids and things like this, as well as the rising of the Kundalini and possibly shamanic and psychedelic things as well. Um, but as we go through, we'll see, um, you know, we'll see how all this fits together. This is my book. It's a small book. It's not anywhere near the size of this. It's deceived a few people when I've shown up. Oh, it's tiny. But I've put together a whole kind of uh, history and outline of what is going on with earth grids, ley lines, sacred sites, and earth energies into one little volume, which was an intense amount of work. We're going to cover some of that in the lecture today. Um, here's, it's actually cut off at the bottom, but it doesn't matter. I just want to sort of paraphrase a few points from this. This is one of my mentors, one of the legendary figures who inspired me more than anyone else in the world, I have to admit. He died a few years ago. Founded Megalithomania with us, uh, this conference and these tours and events we put on. Uh, there's me and him up there on the, on the top right. And John Michelle wrote the brilliant book, The View Over Atlantis, back in 1969. And he was talking about things we're talking about today, but a long time uh, before, before now. And he was a real visionary, a real pioneer. And he, he saw this picture of the way these mounds, megaliths, and ancient sites went from horizon to horizon all over the planet. And we still, even, even back in 1969, and still today, we're still trying to work out what was going on. Uh, and he was very aware of the serpent, what he called serpent or dragon lines, these energies, uh, and how the symbolism became part of that. So I'm really kind of following on from John Michelle's work because he was a big inspiration for me. Uh, and his unfortunate passing left a sort of wide hole about you know, in this kind of research, especially in England. Um, so I'm going to start with um, some sort of ideas about grids. This is uh, a painting my brother did for my book. This is uh, from a Hopi um, creation myth where the creator created these two brothers to create sound and structure with the crystal at the center of the earth. And with these two harmonies happening, it created what, it, what was called spots of the form. And these are power spots on the surface of the globe. Uh, I go into it in more detail in my book, I'm going to move fairly quickly through this, but it just shows you that even very early creation myths of different cultures around the world has some inkling about kind of grids or global patterns. But let's jump on planet for a moment here because this is kind of, you know, we are on an ancient alien cruise, so I want to just have a few little potential alien things thrown in there. Um, I've been fascinated by these grids, but when I started looking at other planets and looking at what other researchers have found, uh, there's a remarkable amount, amount of geometries and alignments and anomalies on other planets. Mars is a classic one. Uh, and you can see here, this is the start of what we're getting into grids here. Uh, if you place a tetrahedron in a sphere, it touches the surfaces at 19.47 or 19.5 degrees above or below the equator, depending which way you put it in. Interestingly, there's massive volcanoes, uh, the Olympus Mons volcanoes, are at that latitude on Mars. We have Hawaii. We have that on Earth, and there's other anomalies throughout our solar system with various planets that also have stuff on the surface of 19.5 degrees north or south latitude. And that kind of compelled me. We even have um, some solar flare activity peaks at the, around this kind of latitude as well. This just shows you uh, where Olympus Mons is, which is the largest volcano complex um, in our solar system. We also have uh, odd geometries on uh, Miranda, Uranus's moon. We have pentagons and hexagons kind of forming there. We even have great big triangles, which could be faces of an icosahedron. Uh, we'll get a bit more into what that means regarding the Earth shortly. 
Even on Saturn, uh, at the north pole of Saturn, we have this huge hexagon, which is double the width of the Earth. It's huge, and it kind of stays there. Uh, it kind of just maintains its composure. It's like a cymatic pattern. It just holds its energy there while everything spins around it. I mean, I don't know if this is just the nature of planets, the nature of the cosmos, but it does make you question what is underneath all this, what is this guiding source behind these different geometries we're finding on different planets, and how does it relate to us and the Earth? He just shows you another picture from NASA. Uh, I just borrowed that off their website. And even on Saturn's moon, the Apertus, we find this ridge that goes around the whole centre of the moon, which is about 12 miles tall, 12 miles wide. It's almost like a wall has been built around the dead centre. It's like a tennis ball has been cut in half and glued together, roughly. Uh, it's very strange. So there's lots of these strange anomalies which really kind of caught my attention when I was looking at grids on Earth. Uh, this just shows you uh, if a dodecahedron is placed within a sphere, which is a 12-sided polygon. Um, and you can see that when the, these Russian researchers back in the early 70s uh, first did some research on this, because they, they were inspired by uh, someone else, Ivan Sanderson, we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, they realise if you just place a dodecahedron, fix it at the north and south pole and rotate it to the right place, the whole mid-Atlantic ridge almost follows this whole dodecahedral shape. So we're seeing first glimpses really of a planetary grid here. And even, even Plato famously said that the ball, uh, the Earth looks like a ball sewn from 12 pieces of skin, paraphrased, uh, which would resemble a dodecahedron, so it's got 12 faces. And this is the, the Ivan Sanderson research that kind of you know, really blew my mind. I mean, this was found in the early 1970s. Um, he was a paranormal investigator, he was a biologist, but he did some excellent uh, research on the different, what he called, vile vortices around the world. And it was, it was later published by Chris Bird um, in an article, um, The Twelve Devil's Graveyards Around the World. And the Bermuda Triangle, which we're actually sailing through right now, um, or maybe last night when we were sleeping, um, we were very close to that. And there's other anomalies. He found lots of different plane disappearances, anomalies, uh, time dilations, uh, and other strange things happening in certain places around the world. And when he mapped them out, he realized they were equally spaced, uh, plus the North and South Pole. Here we have Hawaii, around Easter Island, uh, the Devil's Triangle, or off uh, the coast of Japan, and many others. It shows you the 3D version of that. It's actually what he realized he found was a icosahedron, which is a 20-sided, 20 triangles um, over a sphere. Uh, and this just shows you it here. And obviously, the points are very interesting. And because he found, he does so much research on this, he really did find a planetary grid of work. Not, not maybe the planetary grid, because I think there's many different ideas about this, uh, not just one, but he found something going on that these platonic solids or these natural geometries which fall within spheres do have an effect on the surface. And maybe we're so small, we don't really get it, we don't understand it, uh, but it's when you start looking at the migratory paths of animals, fault lines, and, all the, and lots of other global movements, the way, the way things move around the Earth, you start to see the patterns. Uh, this just shows you the icosahedron here. I've uh, just drawn a line through Africa there, which um, is basically what I believe is the original prime meridian, uh, which many other people are realizing. Uh, it, it kind of clicks everything into place when you look at the placement of sites around the world. The white line there is a very famous uh, great Earth circle, like a global ley line that goes all the way around the planet, discovered by Jim Allenson. Um, and he found many hundreds of sites kind of linking around this. If any of you have seen Revelation of the Pyramids uh, documentary, this is the line they're talking about, although they've widened it to uh, something like 100 kilometers wide, which is cheating. Um, yeah. You know, this was, he's, he's extremely accurate. It's a very thin line around the planet. We'll look more at Earth circles as we go along. But first, let's have a quick look at the Russians' research, because they originally were inspired by Ivan Sanderson's icosahedral grid, he found. Uh, but they felt something else was going on. They actually, you know, these were kind of top right Russian scientists. This is all published in journals back in the early 70s, some of their original illustrations here. And they believe that the Earth, you know, the crystal, there was a crystal at the center of the Earth, and over millions of years of spinning, it attracted mass to it and created the Earth. And they believe the uh, energetic uh, effect of this crystal would still be detected on Earth. And they believe it's an icosahedra and a dodecahedral system 
which is sort of pumping out from this crystal at the center, very similar to the Hopi creation myth, uh, as we heard earlier. And this is sort of speculative, a lot of this, uh, but this has been published in, you know, this was in the scientific journals, so it kind of, um, you know, it's worth taking another look at this. This is like the Earth's net, really, around the planet. Again, this is from the Russians. Uh, they developed this a bit further. Um, and basically things started, you know, slipping into place. There was some you know, ancient civilizations. We have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We have certain points like this one, where the land mass almost forms around it in South America there. Uh, and this just shows you uh, the Icos Hume and the Dodecahedron together. Uh, the yellow and the black, again, with the prime meridian going down the center there. And then you can actually get this grid program uh, developed by um, Beth Hagens. Uh, and you can actually overlay it in Google Earth now. So you can actually go and play with it and mess about with all the geometries. You can zoom in, see where the lines go. And it's kind of fun. Um, and I think it's worth, you know, if you're serious, you know, into this kind of nerdy kind of stuff like I am, you'll, you'll do that. Um, this is a completely different uh, re you know, area of research over in New Zealand from a, a pilot called Bruce Cathy, who unfortunately died recently as well. Um, and he came up with basically, fundamentally, he was following the flight paths of what he believed UFOs were, were happening all over New Zealand and Australia. Different places. <coughs> and he kind of, when he plotted them out, because he was you know, a navigator of the skies, he came up with this grid here and realized they move in straight lines all over the, all over the place and there's some kind of grid there. And he realized you know, by you know, uh, pinning it to something that was discovered in the bottom of the ocean um, uh, in um, off the coast of South America. I don't know how he came up with that exactly. It looks very much like a, an, a, a type of sea sponge. Um, he came up with this, which is basically a cube, an octahedral grid, which is two of the other platonic solids. So suddenly we see all the five platonic solids. We see the tetrahedrons uh, on Mars and Hawaii. We saw the Icos of Dodecahedron with Ivan Sanderson and the Russians. And he came up with the cube and the octahedral grid. And suddenly there was like a sort of full formula forming here, um, which is something that. Um, uh, William Becker and Beth Hagens started working on together. This is a combination. Uh, the yellow is the octahedral grid with the icos and the dodeca. It starts getting a little bit complicated to look at <laughs> after a while. Uh, but here's a nice kind of easy thing to gaze at. Uh, this is the work of William Beth Becker and Beth Hagens. They kind of combined all those together and worked actually with um, some of the theories of um, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Synergistics II, in fact and realized that is, there's more to it than that because of the shape of the Earth isn't quite spherical. Uh, and they kind of worked with the Icos of Dodecahedron fundamentally, but realized the cube and the octahedron also fit, <coughs> um, as does the tetrahedron, and they all kind of click into place. Because when you see things like this, you see the South America area here, this point, kind of the landmass forms around it. And likewise, um, the Gulf Carpentaria here in Australia is another grid point there right that exactly in the middle of that. So these are kind of speculative ideas of energy at work within the planet. Um, some researchers suggest it's all energy. There's an, an ley line, this is all ley lines or alignments over distances or it's even energy uh, that links ancient sites together. I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, I cover the different theories in my book, but as, as I've traveled and as I've accurately sort of plotted these on different maps, Google Earth, this program that John Martin has designed. It's not cut and dry, there's not just one grid. Uh, but there's certainly patterns that you can't deny when you start looking around the world. Uh, this shows you one of the original uh, Becker Hagen's European grids. They, what they did, they were basically professors at the university um, up in New England, and they would get the whole class as a class project for like a year to go through all the different maps and kind of lay out all the different things. So they had this multiple research sort of facility going on. Somehow they let them do it at this academic institution. But they came up with some remarkable finds. This is the, the grid over Europe. Um, but they have realized that since uh, they come, since Google Earth and other uh, satellite technologies come forth, this was back in the 80s and early 90s they were doing this. Uh, there are a few adjustments here, but one of the things that grabbed my attention was this line here. This is over England, and this is very close to the St. Michael line, which is a famous uh, lay, lay line that goes across southern England, which is actually some major earth energy currents associated with that. This just shows you the modern uh, version of it uh, laid over Google Earth. And this just shows you England again here, Britain. And you can almost see how it kind of shapes the landscape 
speculatively. Uh, and here's North America, and we're kind of, there's a big, big point there, and obviously you've got the Bermuda Triangle uh, in that area there. So we're really on a grid point this last couple of days. Um, it's major. Um, and then here we have uh, some interesting, there's like a huge uh, um, communications array here. So the area of the Hohokam, we go back about 10,000 years, and built these big canals. Um, and there's this strange cactus that grows there, which is psychedelic, I understand. Um, <laughs> And you can just see, I mean, this is the sort of thing you probably want to gaze at as you, you know, probably, you thought your house might be on the grid line. <laughs> this shows you the 3D version. Basically, what they came up with eventually was this. But this isn't exactly an icosododecahedron. It's actually a rhombic trigontahedron. You've all heard of that, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this just shows you one of the faces here uh, over this, you know, the area of the Americas, uh, most notably here, obviously. Um, Kind of touches many other sites. So this is very close, uh, some sites down in Peru, Canada, and other places. So, yeah, you can see there's quite interesting patterns for me. And interestingly, back in Scotland, uh, you know, north of England, if you're not sure where it is, um, there's many <coughs> these stone spheres have been discovered which clearly show all the different platonic solids. They've been carved in stone, but you can hold them in your hand. These are all in the museums in Glasgow, there's some in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, this is actually a later Roman one found in France. But these ones here uh, all show five platonic solids. But there's also ones that show a combination of the cube and the octahedron and the icosododecahedron. So we know that they weren't only working with platonic solids and Archimedean solids, but they were, they were combining them, they were messing about with them, they were playing with them. And this is two or three thousand years before Plato was even born. So you can't really call them the platonic solids anymore. So, sorry, Plato. Um, but we know that they, you know, and, and there's actually um, a researcher, a brilliant geometer called Keith Critchlow, and he came up with this. He, he analyzed all the different stone spheres that have been discovered, analyzed them into one unique geometrical spherical system, came up with this, which is identical to the classical Becker Hagen's earth grid system. So he suggests they were using them as navigational tools, they were, using, he was using, they were using them for astronomy, for mapping and even surveying, just using them as props to kind of work things out, which I found, you know, remarkable. Um, so let's get into some other things. So we we'll just give, I'll give you a quick overview of the grid there. I've got much more details in the book on, on the DVD I've done about it as well. But I wanted to give you a quick overview because I think it's quite an interesting subject uh, that a lot of people aren't really sure about. I don't quite get it. Stand. What I'm interested in is also geodesy or geodesy, which is like the connection of sites around the world and how they interrelate. And we'll, you know, I think there's quite an important system here in place that's put there by the ancients that we're just starting to comprehend. This is it's just one example here. Um, this is just an alignment directly between Newgrange in Ireland and the Great Pyramid of Giza. And that distance there is exactly one tenth of the circumference of the planet. If you multiply that by times 10, it will come back around exactly to new range. And so we're finding these kind of uh, correlations in different places around the world. Is it a coincidence? We're not sure. It just shows you another one. Uh, this is more about orientation than it is distance. This is the great Newark Earthworks, which uh, Sheena and I visited uh, last year. And we did a road trip around all the mound culture sites of uh, Ohio, um, Illinois, in all other places for about two or three months, I think it was. About six weeks, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, check, looking for the giants that Mika enjoys looking forward to. Um, and we found, what I found particularly fascinating about this is that if you just draw a line, just following the orientation of it, and just, just continue it around the world, it hits the Great Pyramid. And it's really 6,000 miles away. Um, so it was that coincidence, were they pointing sites to the Great Pyramid? How on earth would they do that? Who could have done it? Were they, were they able to fly through the air to do this? Who knows? But it's there, it's, in the, it's, in, it's carved in the earth, it's built in stone, you can't deny it. It shows you a close-up of some of the uh, earthworks here at Newark. Unfortunately, uh, they've actually built a golf course uh, within the main there were earthworks, a huge area. This just shows you, this is something that Ross Hamilton put together actually. This is one of the faces of the Great Pyramid, the size. To show you the size and, of the Newark earthworks, it's huge. It's vast, it goes on for you know, a few miles, square miles. 
Uh, and he, he believes the geometry of the pyramids was, is also present within the geometry of the Newark earthworks. The same principles are at play. And they want you to keep it there. And they, if you use earth or you use stone, it's unlikely to get too badly damaged, apart from the odd golf course built within it. <laughs> it just shows you the shape of it here. And you can see there the eight sided here, eight sided shape. There's another great earthwork here, which is a huge ditch here, this massive, a massive bank. Uh, look at just a vast scale of earthworks here. This is several, this is eight miles, nine miles uh, wide here. Uh, most of it's been destroyed, unfortunately, but these still exist. That's the most, uh, that's the one you still really visit and it hasn't been damaged too much because it's just simply too big. Again, this just shows you what the one I was pointing at there, the very deep kind of henges, which is exactly what you find at Avebury in England, on a smaller scale of Stonehenge and other sites all over the British Isles and over Europe. Again, this just shows you the alignment close up with the golf course. <laughs> so I get very frustrated because imagine just golf, a golf course in 2,000 years time. Archaeologists can go, wow, this is some kind of sacred landscape. <laughs> well, look at all this. It must be a line to the star. <laughs> so were ancient sites actually sports facilities? <laughs> a new book coming out. Uh, that's just the same picture again. I'm not sure why that's in there twice. Um, but what, what I, I do find that there was an ancient uh, science of global positioning, um, uh, which is what we've just been looking at. So, a various example. There's another one, for instance, Avebury to New Greenwich. Uh, these are, this is two, made them, two of the most impressive megalithic sites in Britain and Ireland. Avebury is huge, it's much bigger than Stonehenge. I've not been there. It's so big, they built a village in it. It actually has a crossroads, a pub, and about 30 or 40 houses in it. It's that big as a stone circle. Then it has these avenues that go on for several miles uh, as well. And if you draw a line between Avery and Newgrange or Google Earth or, or any mapping system, it's one hundredth of the planetary circumference. So they were using kind of these kind of systems even within just the British Isles themselves. Uh, and then we just have other, I've got a few other examples I'm going to throw at you just to get your brain tingling. Uh, but Avery to Chichen Itza is uh, one fifth of a circle, 72 degrees. Uh, and we did, there's, there's so many examples, I haven't really got time to go into detail, but I can, um, it's in the book and I can fire some uh, more info at you day after tomorrow. Again, we have evidence even in the Book of Enoch um, that was discovered uh, that kind of suggests they were surveying in ancient times. Uh, and I saw in those days how long cords were given to the angels. They went and they took themselves wings and flew and went towards the <coughs> north. And I asked an angel, saying, like, why have they taken cords and gone off and replied they had gone to measure? So they're taking wings and flying to places and measuring. So what was going on there? Is this just uh, an analogy of something that was happening or is this an actual description? And so even in the Book of Enoch, we do find evidence. There's other, there's other passages in the Book of Enoch that mention like, windows within stones and things like this, which would suggest they're going to up to Stonehenge area and things like this. So there's lots of little clues you can find as you keep looking. But fundamentally, I think one of the, the key things when you're looking at um, the relationship and spatial distances between sites around the planet is like there has to be a prime meridian. Now forget Greenwich, that's wrong. Um, what I believe the prime meridian was and what most people realize now when they look at these kind of ancient um, sites and the connection between them is that Giza, the Prime Meridian went through Giza Plateau, went through the Great Pyramid, I, I personally think. And then you start everything kind of, all these other major sacred sites around the planet click into place. Uh, this is something that is being studied by different researchers over many years, uh, and I kind of summarize it today and in my book. Even the ancient maps kind of have that area around Giza. Even, well, actually, the, some of these do actually focus on Alexandria, which is a later center of learning. Some of the maps are based on that. But I think the earlier original uh, prime meridian was Giza. And these just show you maps that show that they were traveling around the world. They must have been. Um, it's, it's, this is classic stuff. Everyone's probably seen these. It's Robert's books, David's books. Everyone's kind of knows about these. But I think when you're looking at the spatial relationship between ancient sites, this proves they were studying the whole earth in antiquity and the passages from the book of Enoch were probably true. This is actually a picture from Graham Hancock's book Heaven's Mirror. He let us use it for my Earth Grids book and he found 
again, he was using Giza as the prime meridian and all the spatial relationships between sites were all a certain amount of degrees apart. And all the numbers they were apart were just, they were kind of subdivisions of 360, but they were also processional numbers, which is very, very strange that they were working with processional numbers when they were placing sites, as though they were placing sites to encode their knowledge of procession. Now, this is quite advanced, and they must have you know, have been at quite a high level of intelligence and sophistication to even consider that as a possibility. But the other thing, which is these the same numbers, that all are processional numbers, is the fact that um, when you have, there are also angles within a pentagon are the same as processional numbers. Uh, <coughs> something that John Martin and I kind of realized when we were looking at Graham's research is that Pentagon, it's almost like the Pentagon, which is a specific geometry, is, uh, as we saw earlier, the faces <coughs> of the dodecahedron and other things, um, encode processional numbers, uh, and then that's encoded around the world. So it starts to get a little bit weird uh, the more you look into this. Here's just a few examples uh, of different sites, uh, degrees away from Giza. It's several, uh, several sites. This is actually in the book as well. Uh, <coughs> copied out of the book. But just a few examples here that are very interesting. Like this, These are all from Giza, this whole list here. This whole list is just between whatever sites we were looking at. Forget Giza, that thing. So Angkor Wat's Paraxis, 180 degrees, it's a palm circle, you know, halfway around the world. Uh, Paraxis to Easter Island, 30 degrees, 6 degrees, 1 tenth of a circle, and so on and so forth. So we even managed to get the Bosnian pyramids in there, which uh, so I don't know if that's uh, any evidence to support that, but we're not sure about that. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show you these as some examples that they're, it's almost like the major sites they were building are interrelated. The smaller sites, maybe not so much. It's the big, massive, megalithic sites, the earthwork sites that were there to last. And even if we go latitudinally around the planet, kind of north and south, uh, some very interesting examples pop up here. For example, you know, Giza is pretty much 30 degrees, arguably. Uh, it's not exactly that now with the way we have the equator, but if we go, um, if we go from the equator north, Avery, which is the major megalithic circle temple of Britain, that there to there is one seventh of the way around the planet. And interestingly, if you divide 360 by seven, you get the numbers that come out of the exact longitude and latitude of where it is on the planet which is very strange in itself. That's just one example, uh, which I'm going to give you today. Uh, and even within the 52nd panel, between 51 and 52 degrees, uh, the division between Stonehenge, Avery, and Aurora are all based on sevens. These are like major stone circles in England. So there's some very sophisticated work going on here. Then John Martin and I discovered this. this. This is a huge earthwork. This, this is one of the inner stone circles at Avery. This is bigger than Stonehenge, this circle here. And he noticed these strange angles on the earthworks here. And when he drew lines between them and he divided the angles between them, immediately the longitude and latitude popped up, bang on, 360 over 7. Again, so they're encoding stuff, not only the placement on the earth, they're encoding the same knowledge within the sites themselves. It's just you've got to learn how to read them. Um, here's another quite an interesting example. This is a little bit different view on it, but Delphi, Delos, and Dodona here, which are all uh, in the whole kind of Greek islands area. These are oracle sites of ancient Greece, that area. And they're exactly one degree of latitude apart from each other. And they're actually on this alignment, this 2,500 long mile alignment, with hundreds of sites dedicated to St. Michael and Apollo. Uh, Skelly Michael, St. Michael's Mount, Mont Saint Michel, all these Michael sanctuaries, and it becomes more Apollo sanctuaries, and it ends in Armageddon. Seriously. So we can see that they were working in different ways around the planet. That's a big, it's a big alignment to kind of lay out. This is another great Earth circle discovered by Robin Heath. Uh, the alignment between Stonehenge and the Blue Stone site, where the stones come from in Wales, if you extend that alignment and go around the world, it goes from Delphi, Giza, Mecca, goes through many of the sites, including Serpent Mound, helps back from the Sligo megaliths and back to the Stonehenge again. So you can't deny what's going on here. Now this is just an earthwork site, a huge earthwork site in Portsmouth, Ohio, which we visited. The only thing left of it is this, these two kind of eyes of this octopus type serpent thing. Look how similar it is to Avery, you know, how Avery used to look. 
it kind of really blew my mind. And also we have the sanctuary temple down here, and the equivalent here is this, or this. So we see a parallel here. Now this is about six times the size of Avery, it's huge. Um, so we see a parallel in different areas around the world. This is an ancient, uh, an old picture of Stonehenge. Interesting few little, uh, just following off from Mika's talk there, about Stonehenge. There's been questions about Stonehenge, about who built it and why. And we started to, you know, there is, a, there is a whole sort of movement happening that's suggesting these giant skeletons they keep finding are real. I mean, these are just some reports here. Uh, this is where they found a seven foot skeleton around Salisbury. Uh, this is another early report of a nine foot four inch skeleton in one of the mounds around Stonehenge. This is a photo someone took 4,000 years ago. Uh, but there was actually a huge skull on display in a local church that uh, had been on display for 100 or so years. A huge skull. And everyone thought it was like some fake skull, but it wasn't. It was a real one that was found in a mound around on Salisbury Plain near Stonehenge. Maria Wheatley is working on trying to relocate it to disappear. And even this is the earliest picture that's ever been found of Stonehenge. And it shows Merlin here, uh, the bearded one, summoning the giants over from bringing the, to bring the stones over from ancient Ireland, build what's called, it used to be called the Giant's Dance before it was called Stonehenge. And this is the earliest depiction of that. This is written in the ancient, um, you know, in the ancient books, um, History of the Kings of Britain. This just shows you an electrical resistivity map of Stonehenge. It shows, this shows you all the, uh, the way the earth energies move through it, just an incidental thing here. And just some other earth energies at some sites in America. And this kind of intrigued me. Uh, this is the work of Robin Heath. He's been finding Pythagorean triangles over the landscape of Britain, believing that it was a great survey took place using these triangles. This is the famous lunation triangle. This is the alignment that goes around the world, remember? Serpent Mount, Mecca, Giza, all that kind of stuff. Stonehenge is there. Lundi, which actually means elbow, which I thought was interesting. We actually went there in 2008 and discovered a stone circle at that point. Mm. Seriously, I went over there with Robin Heath and a bunch of researchers. He surveyed what looked like this rough bunch of stones and found a perfect flattened B stone circle as based on Alexander Tom's original geometries. Uh, this is the bluestone site where the stones come from. So it's almost like where they quarried is part of the pattern of the survey, leaving us clues for future generations. And they left some stones there, like they do all over the world. They left the big one at Easter Island, they left the Aswan obelisk in Egypt, even at Gebekli Tepe, they left a big T shaped 24 foot pillar in the quarry there. It's almost like the, these are part of the clues, part of the signatures of what I believe are these serpent people. This is Arbalo, oh, sorry, this is Arbalo. It's beautiful, it's an amazing site on Anglesey. I've been invited to go and be part of this, um, this trip there in the summer, June, uh, because I've been doing a lot of research on this in the background, and these guys kind of wanted me to kind of share it with the group. Um, and we're going to go to this site and we're going to that site, so we're going to hit two points of these two different triangles. It's just one of many giant reports from Wales. I'm not going to go into detail, I don't have to read all that. And just at, on North, in North Wales, um, they found this whole kind of uh, cavern system, this whole cave, this quarry uh, that's deep in the earth. Uh, three and a half, it's a, it's, a, it's a copper mine, in fact, very similar to what we find up in Michigan, Wisconsin, all that area. Uh, three and a half thousand years old, they found these huge hammers. There's no way humans our size, unless they were like, I don't know, Schwarzenegger or someone, could actually carry. So it must have been giant people wielding them. We've got 60, uh, 60 or 70 pound hammers uh, for the, the quarry. This is uh, the trip I've been invited on if anyone's uh, interested. There's some further back. Also, this is, um, this is the alignment <coughs> between, if you continue, between Stonehenge up to the Bluestone site. There's also this has been discovered, uh, which is something we're going to be looking at uh, this summer. It links Stonehenge with Glastonbury, with Avery, with these, with these other sites into this grey star pattern, which Peter Knight, who discovered this, calls the Wessex Astro. This is the Great St. Michael line. This is actually this line here. So we've got the Michael line here, and we've got the alignment between Stonehenge and the Bluestone site here in this pattern within the whole landscape over southern England. So it all gets a bit silly after a while. <laughs> but, uh, can't really keep up with it. So the, this is the original alignment, rediscovered by John Michel, which he published in the Bureau of Atlantis. 
many sites, you know, stretching 300 miles, dedicated to St. Michael, some to St. Mary, and many to St. George as well, who was the dragon slayer. And you see him stabbing the dragon, which I believe is manipulating the earth energies, or is just, or holding, another, another interpretation is that it's holding back the pagan religion to bring in the, the new Christian religion. But what happened was, when Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst went to douse this line, they actually found two great earth energy currents weaving around it like a caduceus, going straight, you know, there's a straight line of it's like the sword of the caduceus, with these two serpents weaving around it in a beautiful manner, one male, one female, hence the Michael and Mary lines. And I've been up and down this line for the last 15 years, I've doused, I've explored, I've had mystical experiences, and it really is quite something. Um, and it's, you know, it goes to Glastonbury, I've moved back to Glastonbury partly because of this. Uh, Avebury, it doesn't go through Stonehenge, Stonehenge isn't far away uh, if you want to visit it. It goes all the way up through my local area where I was born and bred in Cambridge through Wanderbury Ring, which I'm writing a book, I'm just finishing a book about at the moment. It's an incredible alignment, which I believe is actually global alignment. Oh yeah, we're doing a, yeah, I forgot about this, we're doing a trip there as well uh, in the summer, uh, because we're just completely obsessed by it. It's almost like John Martin as well. So anyone who kind of grew up and read The Son of the Serpent, by Hamish Miller and Paul Broaders. That is the book to read. That is unbelievable. That, that was the one book that changed my life completely and made me realize as a mystical, as a secret energetic um, aspect to history. It's not just all about you know, kings and queens and, and dinosaurs before that, as I was taught in school. Um, but this, is a, this is a study, this is a layout of the grid combined with some other major ley lines, so the Michael line. Also these circles of perpetual choirs going to look at as well uh, this summer. Uh, and these are all just the megalithic sites marked on it. There's the Apollo Athena axis, the one that goes all the way through Europe here. We're going to go down here. Uh, I've been there before, on St. Michael's Mount. It's, it's pretty much it's pretty black. And there's the Lunation Triangle there as well, just to, just to sort of last year. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit light. So this is actually up my local area at Wanderbury. This is the Mary energy line that goes through here, and the crop circles always seem to form on these Michael and Mary lines. Hopefully they're going to continue because there's been a bit of a lack of them over the last couple of years. Uh, we're not sure why. Maybe 2012 had enough, the world didn't end. <laughs> and this is the global version that Robert Kuhn put together. He's a visionary. I'm not going to go into detail here, but I'm very interested in this area here and later to Kaka, obviously. We'll end up through Mexico. And here, we're going here uh, next month, this month, I think, in fact, to check out stuff down there. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but we can get into that the day after tomorrow, maybe. And Robert Cohn believes they were like chakra points of the planet, if you're into the more spiritual aspect. And obviously, you know, Glastonbury, heart chakra. So mm -hmm. that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually on Lake Titicaca, it's the island of the sun. My friend Sean Cohen, who's a geomancer, kind of laid out, if you stretch the Michael line all the way around the world, the dead straight line, it goes right through the middle here. And we believe we found these other currents coming here. We went there with a bunch of dows and geomancers back in November with David and a few others. Uh, and this is the plume circle of energy line. So whether these are global or not, we're not sure, but we, we, we found things, they seem to connect. We're just trying to piece something back together. We're not, we're not sure how or why. This is where the lines kind of go through north part of the island of the sun and this is the alignment standing on it and this is the area where Viracocha was said to have emerged the great plume serpent the great feather serpent of god of the andes you know, it's also the sort of where the inca you know originators came from as well so there's a whole story with that and here's the, the classic path of Viracocha, which kind of goes through this whole area and many of the other megalithic ancient sites that he was said to have built with his, with his followers and he's actually said to have created a race of giants to build these sites, which I found quite interesting. But yeah, they're, we're doing a trip there later this year. We we're hoping to get Robert over this year, but we're going to have to postpone until next year, we hope. We don't stop. We want to get around the world. But this just shows you again what we're looking at here. This is where a very powerful, powerful area. It's really, if you're sensitive to energies, that is a place to visit if you want to really get a taste of it. Something about the amplitude as well, combined with that. And uh, there's a lot of geology there. When Robert was over last year with us, uh, and we had several other geologists this year, all saying, saying the same things. There's stuff, there's a fault line there going along the edge of our island of the sun. 
there's uh, some very mag magnetic rock which kind of compresses, there's PTO electrical stuff happening. So that could be part of the reason why they came to safe place with the ancient people. And, and this, you know, I've detected a similar light or the same light going up through Mexico, uh, going up through the Olmec area, specifically through Laventa, which kind of intrigued me some ways. It's one of the classic Olmec sites, which uh, David has written about in um, his mystery of the Olmecs book. Uh, but there's other connections around the world, so I'm going to whip through this fairly quickly. So let me just check this out. Okay. Uh, and we've seen many of the connections already, thanks to the other great speakers we've had um, over this last, or today, really. Yeah, today. But we'll see that there are strange things happening around the world. I'm going to try not to repeat what we've, we've seen already, but there's a few uh, anomalies here. This is just the stone circle phenomenon. Now, everyone just assumes England, Britain is the stone circle capital, which, which it is, because there's a thousand stone circles in Britain. Uh, this is actually one from Britain. This is up on there uh, in... Um, Cumbria. This is actually in Tripoli, uh, in North Africa. This is in Argentina. This is in Armenia, in Caravans. And this is in Silistani, Peru. Um, and so, and there's actually two or three more of these we found this year when we walked a bit further out the way. Um, so that it's not just in one place. Are these the same people doing this? Why would you build circles of stone? Why would you do that unless you kind of was part of a tradition or part of a system you were using. This is the biggest stone circle in the world. This is in Morocco, uh, huge. Uh, I'm planning on going here in the next couple of months, hopefully. It's called Masura. Uh, There's a huge mound within it, but it's literally, it's bigger than Avebury. Everyone thought Avebury was the biggest stone circle, but North Africa has got it. It's got it down. Um, and so it's a fascinating site. This again, this just shows you some of the beautiful, the beautiful looking um, Archaeological park in Argentina with some beautiful carvings on it as well. No one's sure how old that is. And, and well, Quebecli Tepe has stone circles. I mean, we've seen that today. They are like stone circles, really. Uh, they're a bit different, they're a bit more sophisticated, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, we went over there in September of last year, yeah, with Graham and Edward Collins. Uh, and, and this stuff is spotted in one of the books. Um, it's like a bit of head binding going on. And this goes back 6,000 BC, which I found quite interesting because there's actually skulls being found um, quite away from there, but in the general Iraq, Iran region, uh, which shows the elongation. We saw some of these early already, but I just wanted to throw these in there because these are very uh, beautiful relief carvings, which are very similar to, you know, like it's been pointed out already, to Peru and Easter Island. Um, these are just the ones from Silistani. I managed to get Sheena help me with these photos. Yeah, they are very similar. Um, is it a coincidence? I'm really not sure. It's almost like some kind of... These are very weathered. These are just being piled out outside the museum next to some battered old cars. Hmm. Kind of just that one there as well. But they look remarkably similar uh, to what you see. Uh, this is a Katimbo as well. Um, this is another uh, children's site which we went to with David. Um, few months ago. And these beautiful relief carvings again. Can't help it. It's just everyone notices that, that just looks like a Beckley Tepe. You can't. It's, it's a no-brainer. It looks like it. it. If it's a coincidence, we don't know. But I think there's connections here. Even in Costa Rica, uh, this is at the San Jose Museum where, where the stone spheres are kept. The same culture created these, uh, I think they're called lapida boards or lapida boards. And they have these beautiful relief carvings on. Look at this one. Well, look at all of them, they're all virtually the same, but beautiful, just jump out of you, these little critters, these little creatures, virtually the same style and design. So you just, you know, the more you look, the more you see. This is Gobekli Tepe. Uh, this is one of the first ones they discovered there. This is Gobekli Tepe. This is Costa Rica. This is Silistani. This is Silistani. And this is actually where David's uh, recently visited in the Bada, Bada Valley in Indonesia. Let me show you these beautiful relief carvings on this great lid of one of the jars David was talking about oh, earlier. Um, so it's the same, same style, same design. It's pretty wonderful, the more you look. And then we come back to the serpents. Obviously, this is a Gebekli Tepe. It almost shows like a sort of net, net of serpents here. This is from the Vali Kori. It's the back of someone's head, which looks, you know, this goes back to very close to the era of Gebekli Tepe, which is extremely ancient. It's remarkably similar to the Vedic um, symbols and style that you get up from, from ancient India. This is the Cusco, this is uh, Kachimbo, and this, I think, is that Kachimbo or Silistani. 
Then we have uh, Earth Match, that Robert talked about earlier, the cool Star Trek call like that. Um, this was actually, again, this is probably a representation of one of the sphere builders, sphere carvers of Costa Rica. This is in the San Jose Museum. Um, slight resemblance. That one has a little mouth. Little mouth. And this is just, this was found in some kind of ancient Maya grave thing. Again, just looks a bit similar. Andrew Collins pointed that out, so I thought put that in the slide. And, uh, and it also in Turkey, again, we find similarities to Peru, which is something I'm, I'm, I'm extremely excited about because I'm a megalithomaniac. Um, we see these huge polygonal walls. Uh, this is a Lakahuyuk in Turkey, very close to uh, a couple of hour or two from Ankara, uh, the Turkish capital. And I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I just saw some photo on the next side that I saw made our tour company go there when we went there and changed the whole itinerary, upset everyone. But it was worth it. We'll check this out. Um, uh, yeah, we're going back there. We're bringing Brian Forrester with us in May because of the Peru connections. He was desperate to come and he didn't get off my back about it. So um, he's coming with us because we wanted to kind of see what, there's so many similarities to Peru, it gets silly. It just, get, it just, it just gets, it goes on and on and on. And you have to question, you know, who were the, who were the Hittites? Who were the people there before the Hittites? Was there a global, were they traveling? And again, this is just some random thing. Uh, it's not really part of this lecture, but this is actually in the San Augustine in Colombia, uh, which I found remarkably fascinating. If you look at the Moai, the, the red top knots and things like that, so Robert might be interested in that, but that was just a strange little coincidence. He's got fangs. Um, they don't have fangs, I don't think. But these have, everyone, they will have fangs in Colombia, uh, if anyone's uh, interested. And polygonal stuff, we've seen some of this already, but uh, there's this, this is like Crisco, this is the, uh, one of the smaller pyramids on the Giza Plateau. Uh, again, one of the platforms at Easter Island. This is in Western Italy. Uh, there's many, there's like 40 or so sites along the coast of West. This is in Saudi Arabia. Again, we have the relief carvings uh, and the polygonal style uh, together in Saudi Arabia. This is again in Western Italy. Again, we have the we have the great polygonal style with the relief carvings over the doorway. More from Italy. This is in Albania, uh, not far from the Greek border. This is Delphi in Greece. Uh, again, this is Lachihoik and Hattusas, which is again a very close Hittite capital, which has got much earlier uh, megalithic stuff happening here, such as this and this. We went there with Graham Hancock and he was just saying, you could just be walking around Cusco, this is like being a sex a woman in Cusco, it's, it's like the same, it's like almost the same people did it. Um, I can't see how that's a coincidence. You don't just accidentally carve massive megalithic blocks of stone and construct them in the most difficult way possible, um, just for the sheer hell of it, do you? Uh, I'm sure you find the easiest solution. This is a shows you some of the, uh, the megalithic uh, carvings there. This is Graham at the uh, Ledger Wet, which is clearly older than the Hittites. It's, it's actually been documented now. <coughs> early culture. And we find these, these skulls that David mentions as well. And Brian had been doing some excellent research. I know Brian sent me a few uh, pictures recently uh, for, uh, for this lecture. Um, not only do they in Peru, they're all over the place. This is Ecuador, Ukraine, Malta. Go. These are different ones to the ones uh, in the Museum of Mexico. Uh, this is uh, Micronesia, obviously North America, which is <coughs> This one interested me. This is across mountains in Iraq. Uh, look at the size of that. That's about 7,000 years old, at least. So, um, not, you know, it's not near Gebekli Tepe, but it's that general kind of, you know, area. Just gives you a bit more, um, that is some skull, isn't it? That's, that's, you don't want to meet him in a dark alley. Really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not him. Uh, I mean, this one with a scary hello. This is actually found in Pennsylvania. Did you have this in your talk yesterday? This is actually found. This is actually a seven or seven and a half foot skeleton they found in Pennsylvania uh, with horns. And there's been five other skulls found with small horns coming out in North America as well. It's just one of them. It looks fake. Apparently it's not. The research I've done. Where, on it, where is that located? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I've got all the notes on the laptop. I can show you. Uh, it's, it's in one. It's near one of the mound sites or one of the mound sites it's in, in Pennsylvania. No, it was it disappeared not long after this photograph was taken. Probably because of them. 
Uh, this is in Wisconsin, but there's many examples of these elongated skulls, as David and Brian's book uh, clearly points out. Um, but it's just a couple of, I thought this one was just kind of compelling, really. Again, this is just uh, carrying on from what David was saying about the Olmec. Again, had these, these elongated skulls. This is from the, um, I think this is from the National, this might be from Halapa Museum. Uh, I'm not sure if it's National Museum or Halapa Museum. That's the whole Olmec kind of style. J figurines. And these are some examples from Peru, different areas of Peru. This is the whole Paracas culture, the Ica area. This is up in Haraz. Uh, I went up there to see Chabin. Um, they have elongated skulls, they have cleft skulls, and they have a lot of giant skull, all in one little display, which is quite convenient. Uh, again, this is another example of what David showed earlier, which is the gold plating, and, and uh, the bone has grown around um, the, uh, the gold. It should be quite cool, you know, to have a gold area on your forehead. <laughs> this is re more relatively recently found at Pumapuku and Tiwanaku. Um, it's actually, weirdly, it's not in the museum. They've, all the photos David showed earlier, they don't show you those skulls and you're not allowed to see them. But if you go to the nearby restaurant, which is just open, they've got a little area. You can go and see some amazing elongated skulls that have been discovered at Pumapuku. There you go. So, don't need museums anymore, just go to restaurants. <laughs> Loads of examples. This is one of Brian's friends uh, put this together uh, around the world. Just the same thing doing it, really. Um, different, you know, elongations. Some appear natural, some don't. Uh, I'm just fascinated by, I'm fascinated by these skulls. I highly recommend David and Brian's book, uh, Mingo Cranium Leafless. It's a strange phenomenon, and the giants is a very strange phenomenon. I'm wondering, personally, are these the megalith builders? Are these the global elite? Are these the, the navigators? Are these the people who built all these sites? Why are there so many connections? Um, there seem to be two different races to me. There, there seems to be the elongated skull people. Well, they could be aliens. I'm not sure. They might not be. They might just be very strange-looking humans. Um, and then we have the giants. Where did they come from? You know, and were they connected in any way? Or was it a completely separate race? Maybe they were the ones battling it out in all the legends around the world. Who knows? But the evidence is there now. It's there for the taking, and we need to kind of look at this again as a, you know, as independent researchers, just as the general public, to question where we came from and who our ancestors were, because we're not being told the truth, unfortunately. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, I shouldn't really put that on there, because Robert's here. Uh, but this was found. Um, in the Euphrates Valley in southeast Turkey, Gebekli Tepe, uh, and this, this guy's reconstructed some re uh, from some reports that were found of these giant bones um, down in that area. And this is actually you can go see this thing in Texas. I think it's in Texas. Uh, it's probably written on here somewhere. Uh, this guy is actually in um, Peru now with Brian, casting loads of the elongated skulls. So it does suggest, you know, as we see with the, the legends and the biblical stories, that yeah, of course, giants. Were, around in the whole kind of fertile crescent area. Uh, and then this, this is, uh, I've got my tongue in cheek a little bit here. Um, this is a photograph someone apparently paid $200 uh, dollars to see. This is a 20 uh, Egyptian note of a mummified finger. And look at the size of that. And it's supposed to be the, the finger of a giant found in Egypt, which is 16 foot tall. Uh, again, I'm not claiming any fact thing with this. This was taken from the internet. But, <laughs> take a look, some pay 200 bucks to get that photograph then, thank you very much. Uh, it could be a massive fake, it could just be, you know, dried up hot dog, who knows, but uh, <laughs> it could be worth a look. It's got the bone in it, isn't it? And again, jumping back to North America, uh, many of the mound culture sites all over North America, in fact, all over North America. I went to a place called Lompoc Ranch, in uh, California to go and investigate a 12 foot skeleton that was supposedly found there in the early 1900s. This was back six years ago, I guess in 2008 I went there. The whole place is now a military zone. It's a military camp. You can't go into Lompoc Ranch anymore where they, where they found it, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, this, these are from New York State, in fact. This is like Western New York State. There's some reconstructions of bones that were found. This is one of the skeletons, one of the only photographs of a seven foot giant. It would have been seven or eight foot maybe. So he's cut off his knees here. Found actually in one of the mounds at Serpent Mound, not the Serpent Mound, it's one right next to it. 
This is the famous Irish giant, and this is the San Diego giant, which was sold to the Smithsonian for five hundred dollars. And there's a receipt that you can actually find online. So, yeah. um, very similar looking, both twelve feet tall. Um, they, I don't think they're fakes, personally. You know, I really don't. I think this is uh, compelling evidence. And you get these giant footprints. I mean, this is the giantest footprint, uh, unless Michael Tellinger has shrunk somewhat. But, but these, this is found in uh, South Africa. This is uh, actually granite. I don't know how you get a footprint in granite. Must have been, but it's just so heavy, I guess. <laughs> uh, but you see where the toes have gone, and I pushed up the kind of rock there uh, when it was bolting or whatever. So there's more to this than me to know. But I think this is kind of this place is the smoking gun to me. This is where it gets strange because it's the only place I, I'm. 100%, you know, well, there's some places in North America which have evidence of this, where earlier, 100 or so years ago, they found giant skeletons here, between seven and eight feet tall in Sonora, Mexico, which is not that far from the American border, so 150 miles south or something. And more recently, they found the elongated skull people there, in the same place, in the same area. So this is one of the only areas where they've actually, they were, either they were just coincidentally there at different times, they were meeting, there were like these two elites meeting, or it could have been something else. It could have just, maybe the giants were the long heads and they reported properly back in the early 1900s. Uh, this is the guy here who actually found them. The other thing is that they were blonde. These giants they found earlier last century were blonde giants. They weren't, well, maybe red haired as you know, we find in the southwest of America. But so to me, there's, there's this is just all coming out now, like Beckley Tepe is like a relatively new discovery. There's stuff still just buried, and we're still starting to find it. As long as, you know, if the Smithsonian could just sort of go away and stop throwing everything away, uh, we might get somewhere, because I think there's a lot more to be found still. I think people with private collections are gonna come forth with what they've got, and we're gonna start to get some real indication of uh, our, our true ancestry and where we came from. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the things that is wrong with this world we need to kind of address. This is uh, just uh, an Irish example. This is just a small book I'm working on with Jim Vieira at the moment, as Mika mentioned earlier. Uh, we just want to kind of, you know, just bung tons of reports in there, kind of just, just highlights and tons of reports. So it just, it's just like to the, you know, to the institutions. Like, you can't deny this. There's one and a half thousand reports. What, you know, um, you know, it's, you know we're all truth seekers, we're all looking for the, the answers. Sure. what the hell is going on and uh, I guess that's it so thanks very much